Um, I'm going to talk about, um, my, my job is really to give a, an introduction to, to this, the workshop today. Um, and so I will be touching on, uh, I think, things that will be recurring, recurring issues that will come up during the course of um, today's session. But really I want to sort of set the scene in terms of um, talking about social protection and particularly about the aspect of social assistance and how it should be viewed as an economic investment, not just simply a social expenditure. Um, to begin with though, I think we need to get a few things clear. But I'm sure most of you are involved already in the social protection debate agree that it's, it's a minefield. Uh, in terms of the te technology and the, techno the technology, the terminology, the jargon, um, there's a lot of imprecision and a lot of ambiguity. So when people talk about social protection, you mention the word, it means different things to different people. Uh, and that really isn't very constructive. Um, and we often, you know, not really talking about the same things to each other. And it's true to, certainly true that between different countries, um, the terminology is different, but even between different organizations, it's different. It doesn't help. And we've still also seen that the terminology is evolving um, in terms of, uh, as we get to appreciate its wider application. So social protection now is not simply seen as a tool for poverty alleviation as it perhaps started off as being does. But I think it's really emphasizing the point that sometimes the term social protection is misused. And it's misused to the detriment of really what, is, what social protection really is. And so, for example, we have in Indonesia the term being used for a whole range of funds that different ministries manage. They call loosely social protection or social assistance or social welfare, but not all of them really are, meet the criteria of what bona fide social protection is. And I would also argue um, that, and I hope I convince you by the end of uh, my presentation, that I think even the social label um, on social protection and social assistance is misleading, and it undermines the true potential of what these instruments really have. So, what do we mean? I think there are three key terms that we are familiar with. Social protection, um, my feeling is that's very vague and very general, and I don't think it's actually very useful to use that term, but nevertheless, it encompasses a whole range of public uh, initiatives to primarily reduce poverty, safeguard livelihoods, uh, address vulnerability. It consists of two elements, though, which are perhaps more useful and more specific terms which are in common use in Indonesia. Social insurance, and social insurance <coughs> are schemes which the individual who benefits from the scheme contributes to. And they're primarily intended for people who are in employment, who and part of their wages go towards funding that particular scheme. And because they're largely self-financing, they are not very controversial. People are paying into the scheme and they benefit from the scheme, and that's felt to be appropriate. The other half, if you like, uh, of social protection is social assistance. And I think this is a much more contentious issue, and this really is where the social protection debate centers around in middle and lower income countries. These are non-contributory schemes. People receive them without making a contribution. So they're paid for by the taxpayer. Um, and their intention tended to be for people who are left out of social insurance, uh, who are not in employment, or not uh, have access to regular employment, um, or, are not, or are unable to engage in employment. So, those, it's very important to keep in mind the distinction between social insurance and social assistance. 
And when anyone talks about social protection, we have to question, well, is he talking about social insurance or is he talking about social assistance? And I will try and use the term social assistance more than the term social protection in this presentation. The focus of this um, day is on making sure everyone benefits. And we've seen, as, uh, as Lisa sort of pointed out earlier on, that the global evidence is showing that pro shared prosperity and political stability and sustained economic growth are all closely tied together. And that without shared prosperity, you won't, you won't achieve either of the other two. You won't have political stability and you won't have sustained economic growth. And there's a quote there from the IMF, lower net inequality is robustly correlated with faster, more robust economic growth. So inequality undermines economic growth. Now Indonesia has achieved remarkable growth in the last 15 years or more, last 30 years. But that growth hasn't been shared and inequality is increasing. And as a result, there is a risk that growth potential is diminishing. The argument we're making is that social protection and especially comprehensive social assistance is a key economic investment that will help share prosperity in the country. It won't work alone, but if we neglect it, the other instruments that we apply to increase growth and share prosperity won't work either. For this to happen, we need a change in mindsets. We need to do two things in particular. First of all, we need to see the, the poor not so much as a problem, but as a resource or an opportunity. Um, and an untapped asset both in terms of labor, but an untapped asset in terms of a market as well. And we need to recognize social assistance, not simply as an unpopular but, unnecess but, unnecess but unnecessary uh, expenditure, but rather as an investment, that it's something that has a payback. Indonesia's challenge, well, we've had 30 years of healthy economic growth. Um, poverty has reduced dramatically. Uh, the beginning of um, two, 2000, about one in every four people were below the poverty line. It's now more like one in 10. But while extreme poverty has fallen, 40% 40 uh, 40 of people are still considered to be vulnerable to falling into poverty. And it's important to recognize that there isn't a clear distinction between people who are in poverty and people who are near poor or near to poverty. In fact, there's a lot of movement in between. So it's much more than one in 10 people that experience extreme poverty in Indonesia. There's a lot of fluidity between those that are below the poverty line and those that are just above the poverty line. And it's been argued that up to 80% of the population um, are within 3.5% of the national poverty line and are still susceptible to falling back into poverty should there be a significant economic shock. And these things do happen. Um, you know, 1997, the financial crisis, the impact of El Nino on agriculture, um, they, we can't assume that we won't have another significant economic shock in the future. Inequality in Indonesia is high. It's higher than the average for Asia and the Pacific, and it's much higher than the OEC, the average. And the, that prosperity isn't being shared. Half the population, in terms of growth between in the, over the, those four years, five years, only realized 2% of economic growth, when the average was nearly 5%. So half the population received far lower, achieved much far lower growth rate than the average. So you think, wow, this is growing at uh, 5%. But it's not everybody that's growing at 5%. And in fact, it's about 20% of the population, only 20% population that achieve growth 
which was above the um, average, pop, uh, average uh, growth rate. There's another really interesting thing I had to sort of point out here. And I just wonder, is that little bump right at the very end where the extreme poverty, I just wonder if that is a sign of some impact of current poverty reduction measures. I don't know, but maybe Pat Donald will tell us. Right, so poverty isn't being shared, and as a result, inequality is increasing. So the Gini coefficient in 2006 was 0.33%, and it's risen by 25% in five years. And that's not good for Indonesia. It's not good for Indonesian people. It's not good for the economy. It's not good for the future. We're not looking that social assistance can be a driver, is an important driver for inclusive growth, poverty reduction, and stability, political, civil stability. The normal way of seeing social assistance is that we give our money to the poor. That increases their purchasing power, but the direct result is that poverty is alleviated. It's not reduced, it's alleviated. As long as they receive that transfer, they remain out of poverty. When the transfer is taken away, they fall back into poverty. Now, there is some evidence, I would suggest, with Pekaha, that that's what exactly what's like happening. Because when we have the recertification, well, we had to go through the recertification process recently, people after six years of receiving Pekaha, it's taken away from them, and they're still claiming that they, they, they would fall back into poverty. So, that's not good enough. There is, however, a much more complicated process that goes on if you design social assistance correctly. And that happens through multiplier effects. When you give someone money, when you give particularly people on low incomes money, they don't put it under their mattress, they go out and spend it in their local economy. And in doing that, they're purchasing local goods and they're stimulating local demand which in turn increases local employment. And that in turn generates more purchasing power. Now, that happens at a local level with a local program. Also happens at a national level with a national program. There is, so in addition to this demand side impact of social assistance, there's a supply side impact as well. The social assistance improves health standards improves education and generates greater gender inclusion. And these together produce a more productive and more competitive workforce, which increases employment, and altogether this leads to more robust long-term growth, reduces poverty, reduces inequality, provides political stability, and you get a cycle going on uh, of stimulating more robust and long-term growth. So that's the model that we're trying to argue the case for today. Um, I just wanted to say a few things about social assistance with regards to, so with regards to domestic demand. And um, domestic demand is really, stimulating domestic demand is really critical for Indonesia. The economy at the moment is largely export-driven. And that makes it more susceptible to, to uh, economic shocks. And a large proportion of the population at the moment is not really contributing to the economy. They have very low purchasing power. They're largely not, uh, they're largely underemployed. And so their contribution is um, well under its potential level. We increase purchasing power, it stimulates demand for goods. And that's really sort of the, what part of the crux of the, the issue. But it's important to realize that a country like Indonesia doesn't have as many options for stimulating demand in, a, in its economy as some of, well, as countries that uh, some of us come from. Um, in my country, when demand is flagging, the government introduces all sorts of incentives to get consumers to spend more money, to drive the economy, to put money into the economy to create jobs. 
Now, in the UK, you can do various things. You can reduce the level of income tax so people have more money. You can reduce interest rates so people save less and spend more. And you can even go to the extent of giving someone £2,000 for exchanging their old car for a new car. But countries, middle income and low income countries, don't have this range of opportunities to stimulate local demand, domestic demand. But social assistance, I'd argue, is one thing they do have, one instrument they do have that can do that. So, is it time to move away from extreme poverty? We want, what do we want? Poverty alleviation or poverty reduction? Do we want to have a micro household level impact or do we want to have a national level impact? These are questions we need to address and they will help design whether we have a comprehensive program of social assistance or a very narrow program. But I would argue that if you want to have a meaningful impact on poverty reduction, on growth, on shared prosperity, you need to make a meaningful investment. Small programs have small impact, big programs big impact. And a narrow focus also isn't very popular. One of the reasons why Raskin is so popular in Indonesia is because it goes to many people. One of the reasons why the fuel subsidy is popular in Indonesia is because it goes to lots of people. Pekaha isn't terribly popular in communities because community sees one household, one household receiving it and not their neighbour. And they're wondering why, because we all look pretty much the same. Not popular with politicians either because they're too narrow. There's not much vote buying power in that. So what can we do? We can draw the definition of poverty from going to, at the moment, about 7% of the population, the 16 million that we're covering at the moment, to moving up to under 40%. Um, we can look at vulnerability. We can start looking, rather than looking at extreme poverty, we can start looking at things like life cycle approach to providing social assistance, and self-targeting principles. There are ways of targeting social assistance which are not necessarily based on identifying extreme poverty, which is extremely difficult. The harder you try to target the poorest, the more difficult it is. So maybe it's time to give up that idea, especially if we look at social assistance as an economic instrument, not simply as a social instrument, and to look at a much broader definition of the recipients. Right, so this is my vision of how things might happen. At the moment, we've got pretty much this sort of situation, I think. We have non-contributory social assistance in Indonesia, which is covering about 16 million people. And we have, at the other end of the scale, contributory social assistance. Now, that's in a, on a pale color, because it's really only accessible to various categories of people, civil servants, military, corporate, employees. Um, that's the situation before BSJM, um, before the reforms to, to health provision and work-related insurance provision. So I would argue that this is the case we have at the moment. It's a big gap of people that are not covered by anything. Uh, between the poorest 7% and the richest, say 40, 30, 40%, 40 there's no sort of support. And in here, we have people like the disabled, we have people like the, the elderly, um, and we have very young children. With the start of the new approach to social insurance in Indonesia, we're moving towards more coverage in terms of social insurance. So that social insurance block has got darker because it's now going to be something which is universal, universal for uh, a particular part of the population that can afford it, that's in for the formal employment. But what's happening with social assistance? We haven't really tackled this problem about what happens now with social assistance. Do we stay with the existing programs that we have, PKH, BSM, Raskin, and we're content for the social insurance gradually to evolve into a, a much more, um, a, a much wider the, uh, accepted form of support? Or do we do something about filling that gap? 
And what I'm arguing here is that we need to fill that gap with, with a much more comprehensive approach to social assistance. And so we start off in a more ideal situation with social assistance covering people, everyone who can't access or afford social insurance. And gradually, as the economy grows and as that social assistance helps to stimulate more equitable growth, more shared prosperity, reduce inequality, gradually social insurance takes over as people become wealthier, uh, but we still have that social assistance safety net there for people who fall through the social insurance net. So that's sort of a vision that I see in, in terms of Indonesia moving uh, forward in terms of social protection. The important thing is, well, if we don't do something about it, the lack of inclusive growth and the growing inequality is a real problem. It's current. It's an issue now. We have to do something about it. And it's not just a problem for Indonesia. It's a problem that many middle-income countries are facing. We need to see poverty as a dividend. Um, we need to see the poor as an opportunity, not simply a problem. We need to see them as a source of domestic consumption and a source of productive growth. Extreme poverty may not be, uh, I argue, the most appropriate focus for social protection as an economic instrument. And I think we need to move away from the poorest 10% to perhaps the poorest 40%. And that means looking at social assistance in a comprehensive approach. And we're not just talking about social. It's, this is an economic investment. We have to get the idea of Across, that social, investing in social protection, whether it's social assistance or social insurance, is a necessary economic expenditure. So it needs to be recognized as a macroeconomic instrument. Uh, it's not enough on its own, but at the same time, if we don't include it in our package of economic instruments, the other instruments won't work as well. I also want to sort of suggest to you that with our focus at the moment being really on social insurance, with the work that's being done on rolling out health insurance to everybody um, to universally, and also rolling out work-related insurance, that are we not putting, as we say, the cart before the horse? I'm not sure how that actually translates into Indonesian, but um, uh, what I'm saying is really, will we be better to be investing first in social assistance and getting social assistance working properly before we invest too much in social insurance. So two final questions, I think, about the time. How do we bring around these reforms? I don't think, I mean, these are big reforms. They're not the sort of thing that happens in adjusting annual budgets or even five-year um, plans. They need some vision from the political elite, a recognition of that there is a political will and commitment to bring around change. It, this has happened in lots of other countries, um, and I don't think Indonesia is immune from that. And finally, we have to ask the question ultimately, does Indonesia today have a social assistance system which is commensurate with its status as a middle-income country. If you look around some of Indonesia's neighbors, you'll see that, for example, Laos, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines are all introducing ambitious social assistance-related programs. Um, the challenge is now for Indonesia to start looking at comprehensive, large-scale social assistance to complement existing ongoing social insurance. Thank you very much.